In this interview review video, you'll get a chance to practice by answering interview questions. Specifically, we'll talk about neighbor discovery protocol, and I'll give you a chance to think about what happens as overhead before any user traffic and what happens in reaction to user traffic. Let's take a look. So imagine you're in this interview and you're in a room and it's got a marker board and you see this diagram on the wall. The interview starts telling you this, hey, I want to talk about neighbor discovery protocol. Imagine static addresses are used all over, so there's no dynamic address assignment. And A up here is going to ping S2's global unicast address, and it's going to work. All right, So you can uh, infer some things knowing that. And they say, hey, let's focus on this top subnet with PCA and router R1 in it. For our discussions of NDP because there's you know there's lots of examples of NDP we'll focus up there and explain NDP and I want you to break it down for me says the interviewer for the events that happen before the ping that is like overhead and then the events that happen in reaction to the ping to support the ping so that it will work all right so that's what you're asked to do now here in this video series on YouTube it's like hey you just saw some videos about NDP um, think about those things, kind of order things in your mind, and get ready to describe what happens in this area. So your instructions here for our exercises, I want you to either speak to yourself or find some people to listen to you, speak to others, or if you don't have any people around, you could type or write your answers down. You could even post to a forum, take some screenshots of the exercise and post to a forum. All those things are fine, but don't just watch the rest of the video. This is meant to be an exercise, not just more video for you to watch. You want to keep in mind accuracy. So if you're thinking you might know something, but you might not, don't make it up. Just try to be accurate. Use all the terminology that you can and use it correctly and be clear in your explanations. It's good practice for that interview. All right. So I'll give you a few seconds to hit pause and then I'm going to dive in and start talking about what I'd expect to hear from someone in this kind of an interview. One more chance to hit pause if you don't want to hear the answers. So last spoiler alert, here we go. All right, you might have guessed from that heading slide, the first thing is duplicate address detection. This happens pre-ping, then host routes are added by the host, host A in this case, since we're focusing on that upper subnet. That's done with NDP RS and RA messages, or the information is gathered that way. That gets us up to the overhead that's needed beforehand. Then, in reaction to the ping, we need to build neighbor table entries with NS and NA messages. So I'll talk through these in this same sequence here over the next few moments. But let's talk about what I want to hear from them about how DAD is used. So it's one thing to say, oh, duplicate address detection is how a host detects if its address is used by another device, so it won't use it. That's a good start. But here's the deal. If we focus on that upper subnet, A and R1 both will do DAD, and they'll do it for their own global unicast addresses. So A does DAD for its GUA, and similarly, R1 does DAD with its global unicast address. All right, so that seems straightforward and seems like the most obvious thing, but both of them do it. In addition, remember the link local addresses? Those are unicast addresses. They need to be unique on that link. So those devices will also use DAD on those. So A will do DAD on its LLA. R1 will do DAD, duplicate address detection, on its LLA. So that's an additional point I would be listening for from the interviewee. Then, of course, I'd want to know if they understand how DAD works. So using the example from the content video, if A and servers B, C, and D were all on the same link, then A would do its duplicate address detection like this. It would send out this NS message, but it would expect to not get a reply. This NS message would have a target of its own IP version 6 global unicast address, for instance expecting no one else to be using it, expecting to not get an NA in response. Turns out if C over here was using the same IPv6 address, it would send an NA. That would be A's notification that there's a duplicate address in use. Now let's get into some things I would consider kind of like bonus points. 
So here's the deal. If you understand the solicited node multicast addresses and Ethernet multicast addresses used in this message, I would consider that a bonus because you don't really have to know that in order to understand that DAD is happening and what its benefit is. So in this case, with a target of this IPv6 address, there'd be a solicited node multicast address. And if you could tell me the specific solicited node multicast address, that is, you could derive it, bonus points. And if you could derive the Ethernet MAC address that would be derived from the solicited node multicast address, even more bonus points. All right, so those are things I personally would be listening for interviewing someone just to see if they happen to know it, not because I think they really needed it for a job, for instance. All right, so to summarize data actions that happen right up front on that top subnet for my interview scorecard, knowing that A does DAD for all its unicast addresses, that includes GUAs and link local addresses, R1, routers do the same thing. Then multicast addresses, how much do you know about the use of solicited node multicast and Ethernet multicast as used to perform DAD? What routes does a host use? Well, they do use some with IPv6, and it uses information learned from a router. So when I'm listening as an interviewer, the first few things I'm going to be listening for, not all, but the first few, include what routes will a host want to add, like a default route or a same subnet route. Then how does it build them? What is the process for the default route and the on-link route in particular? And that includes consideration of router R1's link local address, not GUA, to build the default route, and learning the prefix to use in the on-link route from the router rather than calculating it. All right, so those are, those are some important features to distinguish. So in this case, what does host A's routing table look like? Well, it's going to have this default route. It's going to be designated by double colon slash zero. That's an important factoid to know so that you can recognize it. Additionally, while it doesn't list the specific link local address, that you know that it's the router's link local address, not global unicast address, that will be listed as the host's next top address for that default route. Additionally, then, the host will learn any prefixes from the router, like this prefix in this example. That's the correct prefix, but there's no next top router because it's local. It's a connected route, if you will. So there'll be a designation of, hey, this is a route to an on-link prefix. Communicate directly with any hosts that match this particular prefix. Now, it's important that the interviewee also understand the mechanisms. For instance, the router solicitation and router advertisement message. If host A is soliciting information from the router, it sends this RS, but it has addresses in the headers, right? And that message has a destination of the all routers well-known multicast address of FoxFox02 colon colon two. That's something I'd expect them to remember, that specific address. And to know that that's sent as an Ethernet multicast. Now, whether they remember the Ethernet multicast address, I personally am a little less concerned about, but knowing the IPv6 multicast address you're going to see it in show commands. It's important that you remember what that is. And that they remember that the router um, advertisement that flows back in this case is a unicast. It's sent to A's link local address, so it can flow to A's MAC address. It's specifically sent back to host A. Then additional mechanisms include how the router can send an unsolicited or a gratuitous RA to advertise itself to everybody in the LAN and to reach everyone in the LAN. It sends the message to the well-known reserved multicast address FoxFox02 colon colon one, which is an address used by all IPv6 hosts. So all hosts would get this message and learn about the router's um, IPv6 addresses as well as prefixes as usual with an RA. So those are a few of the mechanisms and addresses I would expect the interviewee to remember. I'd also expect them to know that that RA has on-link prefixes listed in the RA. So say if that's a prefix that exists on this link, that when A is building its routing table, it's not calculating that. It's waiting to hear this RA message that includes the prefix and the prefix links. It then places that into its routing table with that notation of on link to mean this is a route for a subnet that's on this link. Communicate directly with those. 
whew, that's a lot to review, right? So there's a lot with NDP. So to summarize some of the things I'd be listening for on my interview scorecard, that host A, it's receiving that RA. I want you to explain the solicited process with RS and RA and the gratuitous process where the router just sends the RA and those differences. Uh, I would ask you to explain how a host thinks or its logic when building that default route and what that ending default route looks like. Similarly, the process of building on-link routes that we just reviewed. And maybe bonus points is the use of the multicast addresses then when using the RS and RA messages in which multicast addresses are used. Everything that's happened so far is overhead that happens up front before the ping, then months could go by. And finally, A pings server S2's global unicast address. Now that packet is gonna have a source of A's global unicast and a destination of S2's global unicast. But some interesting things happen here, especially in regards to these neighbor table entries. So my interview scorecard, I'm gonna be listening out for that not because I think it's trivia, but because when you get into the depth of troubleshooting and understanding, it might be useful to know these things. So the clear understanding of the line between what happens before the ping and in reaction. So before duplicate address detection, before you can use an address, then the routes learn from learning things about the router. Then in reaction, it's these neighbor table entries we're about to talk about. Then what neighbor table entries are needed to support that ping? And it can be a little uh, surprising. First off, PCA, it needs an entry for router R1's, not GUA, but it's LLA. But R1 needs an entry for host A's global unicast address, or GUA. Interesting, huh? So we're going to talk through that here in the next few minutes. By the way, the reverse are not needed. A does not need a neighbor table entry for R1's GUA, and R1 does not need an entry for PC1's LLA to support the ping. It might for other reasons, but to support the ping, not. So let's walk through that just a bit over the next few minutes. So host A issues the ping command like this, creates a packet. Source address is host A's GUA, destination address is what's typed in the command up there, all right? Remember, beforehand, A has a routing table like this. The default route that points to R1's link local address, and then the on-link route. Now, this destination is not in the on-link prefix, right? It's far away. So it matches the default route, which means host A is going to forward this packet based on this default route forward to R1's link local address. So that's part of the reason for this neighbor table logic. Because the route says send to R1's link local address. By the way, it'll list the actual address like this one down here would be R1's link local address in this case. That's how host A then says, all right, that's my next top address. Let me find its MAC address. That's the MAC address I'll use when encapsulating the packet to send it from host A down to this router. Yeah, kind of interesting, huh? So maybe not what you would expect, certainly different from what we experienced in IP version 4 because it didn't have this idea of a link local address. So the encapsulation by host A would be the MAC address of R1 based on that correlating neighbor table entry based on its link local address. But the destination IPv6 address came from the ping command itself, its server S2's global unicast address way down here at the bottom. All right. But that gets the frame down to R1 so it can de-encapsulate the packet, make a forwarding decision, and forward the packet on its way. So that's part of the story moving down the diagram. Now if we take a look here at the neighbor table here on, let's see, host A, here we see the entry that was used. That's R1's link local address, the corresponding MAC address that got used to forward this frame. Now let's look at the return packet that flows from server S2 back up to host A. And because the interviewer said, hey, let's focus on NDP activity up here in this top subnet, we'll focus on what happens when R1 has the packet ready to forward over the LAN up to host A. So that's the storyline. 
what do we need to see happening with NDP? Well, R1 is going to match a route based on the destination IPv6 address of host A's address, and it's going to be this connected route. Now, that connected route does not have a next top router. So in essence, R1 is going to be thinking, all right, how do I deliver a packet directly to host A's IPv6 address? So it needs a neighbor table entry, and specifically this neighbor table entry for that specific address that's in the packet, the global unicast address that you see in bold here, and it'll use this MAC address. So if we look at the headers, and here's the IPv6 packet encapsulated in an Ethernet frame as it flows up the network out of R1, it's going to use the destination IPv6 address that's been in the packet all along, host A's address, and host A's MAC address. And where does R1 get this MAC address information? Well, it's right there in the matching neighbor table entry. So to sum up for the whole interview review video just a bit, interview scorecard. I want a clear understanding from the interviewee about what happens before with duplicate address detection and adding routes to the host and what happens in reaction for those neighbor table entries. Now, the subtlety of which entries are needed is a little bit bonus, but I think it's useful and would impress me if they knew all these subtleties. But what's needed? Well, PCA, using a default route that refers to R1's LLA, needs an entry for R1's link local address. And then R1, sending the packet back, sending a packet address to the global unicast address, needs an entry for A's global unicast address. Conversely, then, what's not needed to support the ping on A is an entry for R1's global unicast address. It's not needed in that case, nor is an entry for R1 to know about PC1's link local address. They might learn those entries for other reasons, but not in support of this ping. If you enjoyed that and want a little more, I'll tee up a few more questions, although I'm not going to give an explanation. You can think on this for yourself, but think about and create all those neighbor table entries needed for server B on that bottom land, both on the router and on server B, and then think about neighbor table entries needed for those routers on the WAN links in the center of the figure. So you can take a few moments and think about that. Hope you enjoyed this interview review. It's a great opportunity to really dig in and think about what you just learned. Hey, if you haven't already, click subscribe and click the bell to get notified. As always, click like to help me build the channel. It's much appreciated. Thanks for hanging out. Talk to you later.